just wanted to make you aware that we still have about 10 or 15 of these boxes for Operation Christmas Child uh, that you can pick up today. You can't leave until they're all gone. So we've got par- people out in the parking lot. No, I'm just kidding about that. But listen, if you have picked one of these up, the deadline for returning it is tomorrow. And we still have some left. So if you are interested and you didn't get it, please do. Uh, you can find these back in the children's ministry area or ask one of our volunteers and we'll make sure we get one, okay? Or you can take this one from the front of the stage where I'm going to put it. But I want you to make aware of that and, and pick that up if you can or if you're interested. Also, uh, Pastor Jack mentioned a couple of things, you know, about our, our White Elephant series coming up. I also wanted to make you aware of the business meeting that's happening December 1st. That's going to be a Wednesday night here, and we're going to have Worship Wednesday with that. We're also having Celebrate Recovery every Sunday night right here. I normally say that's at 5 o'clock, but when we meet on the 12th, we're going to do things a little different that night. But we're inviting the folks from Celebrate Recovery to worship with us and have their groups beforehand. So just make, make a note of that, and, and uh, don't show up that Sunday morning here because we won't be here, and you'll be stuck in a traffic jam but um, do be praying for the people that are competing in that race on the 12th because they need that just as much i'm going to pray and ask god to to bless our time together this morning and um, that, that he would move in our lives lord thank you for this day and for this time that we've come before you i do ask that you would do that that you would work in our lives you've already been doing that as we've been worshiping and praying and singing and thinking about our response to you and so Today, as you speak to us through your word, I'm asking that you would just continue to point those things out in our lives, those adjustments that you want us to make, uh, those changes that you're asking us to do and take a step of faith with. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So earlier this year, my son, who lives up in Orlando, called me and said, Dad, I've been a Michigan fan my whole life, and I've never been to a game. Come on, let's go. And he says it just like that. And it's true, when we started in ministry and left Fort Myers, Florida, and moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan to do a church internship there, uh, he played basketball at the Ann Arbor YMCA. And so three times a week, I drove this five-year-old then by the big house each and every time we did that. And it just kind of was one of those images that stuck in his head. And so about a month ago, off we went to a game. The weather was perfect. It's 50 degrees at kickoff. It's about 40 at the end of the game. I got a picture of us in the stadium. I want to pop it up there for you just so you can see it. Yeah, that's us right there with 109,000 of our closest friends at some point. Now, look, I know some of you are worried. I thought he was an Alabama fan. What happened? My jersey is on underneath that sweatshirt. He made me put that on, and I did that for him. It's the one and only time I did. He's actually on his way back this week to go to a game next week. He's having so much fun with it. But while we were there, I learned that they have this long history of selling out games. Almost 300 games straight, they've filled that stadium to capacity. Why is that? Because people keep showing up. They don't worry about what's happened in previous games. They don't worry about coaching decisions. They don't worry about what their record is. And they certainly don't have enough sense to worry about the weather. Nothing will stop them from getting together because they know they want to be part of an experience where they gather together with people who are like them. They talk like them. They hope like them. And they get excited about the same things other people do. And, you know, each week here at High Point Church, we experience some of the same thing. We get together with people that we are committed to, even though it quite isn't as many as there are in that stadium. Maybe someday we'll get there. But you and I still show up here, and we come expecting to worship. We come expecting that Almighty God is going to show up and do some things and change some lives as a result of that. We come expecting to meet people who are just like us, and maybe even some new ones. And we come expecting and ready to be prepared to be taught the Word of God and to fellowship and to break bread together and to pray together. We come because we're joining into and living in and staying in a community of faith right here. It means that we're continuing to the unremitting care of the people of God and making our attention to meeting together all the time in one place where we can spend time learning to love God and love people exactly the way he wants us to. 
And we do all of this because we are devoted to doing this, and we're devoted to this because God says we should be devoted to this. And so today, I want us to think about why it matters that you and I gather together on Sundays and throughout the week and what difference it should make in our lives. And today, I want us to do that by reading about God's people who already did that. And hopefully, what we read about and what we hear about and what God says about it will make us want to do that as well. And so if you have a copy of the Bible, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. That's where we're going to be today. Acts 2, 42 through 47. And if you don't have a copy, it's going to be on the screen behind me. It says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. When I was in second grade, I failed a math test, and my teacher said, I need you to take this home and have your parents sign it. Now, I knew I was going to be in trouble once I brought that home. My mom was a teacher, and I knew that I was going to get it when I got home. So I came up with a good idea at the time. I decided I was going to forge my mom's signature on the test. The problem was I couldn't write cursive yet, and mom was an English teacher with impeccable handwriting. So I came up with another great idea at the time. I decided I was going to look in the back of my spelling book and teach myself how to write cursive. So I did. I found a couple of moments during recess or whatever and you know, traced out the, the lettering from the back of the spelling book, placed the sign test on my math teacher's desk, and later asked if she saw it because I just kind of hit it there you know, and, and took off. And, and she said, yeah, I did, and uh, thanks for getting that to me. And that led to a phone call home which led to me not being able to sit down for a while. <laughs> you know, even though I could look in the back of the spelling bee to see how to sign that, there was something, it's not something I could master in one lesson. And I think being a Christian is the same way. We can and should look in this book and see how to do it. But in order to master this, it's going to take time, practice, patience, God's power working in us, being around other people in the, Christ, in the body of Christ. <clears throat> and all that starts with understanding the forgiveness that he gives us and that he offers us by coming from heaven to earth to die on the cross for our sins. And when that happened, Jesus wants to change our lives. And he wants us to allow him to come in and make us different and whole and complete so that we can follow him the rest of our life. <clears throat> and I want to ask you, have you done that? That's where the book of Acts starts. It starts with, with Jesus coming and actually ascending. Can I get that bottle of water, please? <clears throat> I'm sorry, folks. Thank you so much. <clears throat> that should be better. It starts with, with Jesus ascending to heaven and then leaving things in the charge of the disciples. And as a result of that, he sends the Holy Spirit and Peter preaches a sermon and many people are saved. And then we get this behind the scenes, 30,000 foot drone-like view. How'd you like the view of the drone from last week? That was amazing, wasn't it? That's what we're getting here. We're getting this overview of the church of the beginning of it but this isn't included just so we can get a history lesson of what went on then it's put here so that we can know what we should do once we've become devoted to doing what god wants with the people that he's asking us to do it with and so that's the question we want to look at today what will change when we are devoted to doing what god wants the first thing that's going to change is what we see Yes, we want people to understand and know that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. All of those four things listed in verse 42. 
And we often seek to use this passage to know how that's going to affect us. That if you do those things, you're going to have explosive growth in the church. And yes, we want God to show us what happens when we get together and show us how to be unified so that will help us take over and rule the world. I mean, take the gospel to and reach the world. But there's one thing I notice here uh, when what, that the writers overlooked, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Where is God in all of this? Think back to a time in your life when you read something or saw something incredible in your life or a story in the Bible. Maybe it's the Red Sea being parted. Maybe it's the walls of Jericho falling down. Maybe it's David defeating the giant Goliath or Daniel in the lion's den or Jesus and the resurrection from the grave. Or maybe it was when he healed someone you knew or that they, God provided a job for them that they never should have gotten or a relationship that was restored. Whatever it is, how did that change what you see? <clears throat> and did it cause you to go, I got to bring all my friends to hear this guy speak or read all of his books or follow that worship team or to get to know that connections pastor because that guy is awesome? <laughs> or did it cause you to become more amazed at who God is and what he can do through his people? <clears throat> And when amazing things happen, that should open our eyes and help us to see how great and mighty God is. It should increase the reverence we have for him and make us want to know him more and follow him further and grow closer to him, all because we see him differently than we did before. And as I was preparing for this and looked through some study Bible notes and some commentaries, I noticed that some of those writers skipped over what happens next in verse 43. You see in verse 43, it says, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. It's very easy for us to go straight from 42. We do these four things to verse 42, verse 44, and we get all these results. But I think it's important for us to spend some time there at 43 for a minute and slow down because we can look past the filled with awe part and want to see the signs and wonders. But anytime we start thinking about what we can do and how many people are paying attention to what we have pulled off, we've skipped over the most important part too because when we start getting devoted to doing what God wants, that should change change what we see because it's, it, because it changes the way we see him. We shouldn't want people looking at us because we're not the ones that he, we need to be worshiping. It's God that's doing the work through people. <clears throat> and if they were here today, these apostles that perform these miracles that transcended the common cause of nature <clears throat> would tell us that these remarkable events could only be done by God even when it is being, being authenticated by men who show who God is. <clears throat> and these leaders wouldn't want you to follow their Instagram accounts or listen to their podcasts or try to imitate them and how great they are. Yes, God worked through them, and so they were playing a part in it, but it all started with them knowing him. And that's because that's where all holy work starts, with knowing God. And all of their power to do these things comes from him and him alone. And these guys knew that, and we need to be reminded of that. Chip Ingram says that what, we, what comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. He's actually quoting A.W. Tozer from years before. And he says, the way we act as believers and as the church clearly states what we actually think about who God is. And until we learn who he is, we'll never become all that he created us to be. And so I wonder what stories we will hear in the coming years of how God has worked and moved in our lives here at High Point Church. Will we see examples of marriages restored and families brought back together and made whole? Will we hear about people getting jobs that, that were unexpected and undeserved, but they're unashamed to show up because God sent them there? Will we see people exalting themselves and, and God's humbling them by placing them and pushing them into new arenas where they witness something and then become a witness to something? Or will he be humbling them as they try to exalt themselves by showing that they can do that on their own power? And so when we look at all that God has done in our lives, how does it change what you see? The second thing that it changes is what we do. Once we start following Jesus, the next step is to get involved in a community of faith called the church. And when God asks that of you and me, understanding that he's not asking us to do anything that he didn't require of the early disciples. Eugene Peterson says, the question is not, am I going to be a part of the community of faith? But how am I going to be a part of the community of faith? 
And he says, some run away from this, and they pretend that the family doesn't exist. And some move out and get an apartment on their own and make an occasional return visit every now and then. But they don't really hold those others in high regard. And then there's some that never dream of leaving, because, but they cause others to dream about it a lot because of the way they're always criticizing and quarreling and complaining and ignoring and taking advantage of other people. And then there are others who are determined to find out what God had in mind by placing them in a community of faith called the church. So they learn how to function harmoniously and joyfully and seek to develop spiritual maturity that's able to share and exchange God's grace with others. Those are the kinds of people that we're reading about here. And when he says all the believers were together and had everything in common, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Notice that we've now gone from talking about everyone to all the believers. Something has changed here, and that's because something is supposed to change when you meet Jesus, and it starts changing what you do in your everyday lives. He's pointing out that the people of God have been persuaded to place their confidence in God, which leads to trust and conviction that compels them to do a certain work. And that's what we see happening here at High Point Church. This is where people getting, they walk in the place where God is walking with them and changing them, and they're relinquishing their hold on the things that you possess, and and you, you know that God owns it all, and all you have comes from him. And that means that you can look forward to opportunities to sell goods and wealth and property and distribute those to people who are in need. And as the believers get together, he changes what we do by changing who we care about and what we're willing to do to help them. And we do this because God tells us to do it and because we grow from it and because people get saved and get to follow Jesus because of it. So last week, when you started giving your radical generosity offering and your pledge through the end of the year, we told you that this is going to be used to strengthen the community. You heard about how it's going to help Refuge on the Ridge and Helping Hands of Christ Ministries and how Providence Center is going to be started and there's going to be counseling available and who knows what else God's going to dream and birth out of that. And I know that Pastor Jack and Pastor Bonnie thanked you earlier, but I want to take time to say it again. Thank you for what you have helped us do. You have done this. And just like he said earlier, when we start getting devoted to doing what God wants, no matter what you give, no matter what you give up, it matters. It's going to change lives because of that. And we've already established that all this happens because people meet Jesus and then want to do all they can to help others meet him as well. And when he changes what we do, that, look how that works out practically in their daily lives. I love this part where it says they sold these things to give to anyone who had need. And when I read that, typically speaking, my mind just automatically goes to financial needs. But, you know, those aren't the only needs that we have and that we see in people's lives, are they? There are all kinds of needs that people might have that when they come here, they need to have those needs met. There might be a spiritual need. Maybe they need to be connected to a church and go to our Connection Track event on just December 5th and make, get to know some people and develop some relationships and get in a small group so that they can be encouraged and challenged and mature. Maybe they've got physical needs. Maybe they need someone to help them walk in. Maybe they need someone to help them find a seat. Maybe they need a ride because of their car's broken down. Maybe they just need someone to give them some some support during that time. Maybe it's an emotional need. Maybe they're just going through hurt. And every time they get to this time of year, it reminds them of all the people that have been in their life and no longer are. And now as a result of that, they feel alone. And they should be able to come in here and no longer feel that way. Maybe it's a marital need. Maybe it's, maybe it's a marriage that's struggling and they just don't know how they're going to make it anymore. And are they going to make it through this holiday time? Because all they can think about is what the new year might bring. And maybe that there's someone else that's coming in the middle of them. And we need to come alongside them and help them. Or maybe it's a financial need. Maybe they just need someone to sit down and show them how to manage their money. All of that can happen. All of that should happen. All of those are needs that can be met in the body of Christ. 
And when we get together and start devoting ourselves to doing these things, that's when we can offer things like mentoring and tutoring so that they can progress in their schooling and job coaching so they know how to fill out a resume and they know how to dress for a job interview and they know how to shake hands and look someone in the eye. That's where we can help with financial planning and budgeting. Maybe someone doesn't know how to, how to figure out how much is coming in and how much is going out and what I need to do to change that. We can have people sit down with them and help them with those needs. That's, this is where we can teach married couples how to actually fight well because you married people know you get in fights, right? Anybody else? Don't raise your hand. Never mind. Don't do that. I don't want you to get in one right now. But this is where we can come alongside married couples and teach them how to love and respect each other and resolve conflict together and actually stay together. And then you can go and be helping other married couples that are struggling in the same things. This is where we can offer groups and places like Refuge on the Ridge that help others live free from addiction because Jesus can really change those things. And he can make you live differently as a result of that. And he can help your family love you again when you get through that. And he can bring you around other people who help you realize you're not the only ones that are trying to raise godly kids in an ungodly world. This is where, in the church, we can get into vital relationships with people that will just put our arms around us when we're hurting. Listen, our hope is that we create and develop a ministry model here that Andy Stanley says will connect people quickly and keep them connected so that they can go out into the community and do what God calls them to do. And so I want to challenge you this morning to think about what is it that God is calling you to do? And I'd love to talk to you about that. If you are here this morning and God is starting to put some things on your heart and mind and you're going, I don't know what to do. I don't know how we're going to get there. But then let's sit down and talk about that. Let's talk about what you're dreaming about and how we can help you do God's calling for your life. There's a third thing that changes when we start being devoted to doing what God wants. It changes what we say. I, a couple weeks ago, I officiated a wedding for some dear friends of mine, and they're here, and I asked them if I could share this story, and they said yes. And that wedding for me was a couple of firsts. I've lived here 16 years, and I've never done a wedding at the gazebo down at Lake Wales Lake before. So that was pretty neat. And, and also the second part that was a first for me, I've never had an uninvited soloist just show up and sing songs during the wedding like this person did. We still don't know who they were, and if you're here today, I appreciate it. Um, maybe we'll talk later and book you for the next wedding that we do. Several of us are at the gazebo. I'm standing at the front with the groom, and we're waiting for the bride who was in a car, and she's going to walk down the plank, I mean, peer towards me. I tried that joke on my family. They didn't think that was funny, so thank you for laughing. She's walking down the pier towards us, and it's, a, you know, about... She's going to do that, and about 15 minutes before the ceremony, the wedding singer shows up, uh, pulls up on the sidewalk, basically, not because, you know, there's 30, 50, 100 open parking spots, but they pick the one right on the sidewalk, um, open their car window and their door, start playing music at the top of the volume and belting out these songs. And, and I mean just louder than our music here could ever be, and they've got no microphone or anything. Now look, it would have been great if it sounded great. <laughs> it didn't. I, I mean, it, it was bad. It was bad. I, I think I heard cats and dogs howling, begging people to, to stop it. Glasses shattering. I think the photographer had to change lenses because the lens broke. I was worried the cops were going to come and shut us down for a public disturbance. It was that bad. You were there. You were there. But at some point, the wedding singer realizes where we were and starts singing some love songs. A little bit softer now, a little bit softer now, and just, just decides now's a good time for me to, to just kind of quiet things down and kind of set the tone. And, but listen, as they continue to sing, you've never heard a rendition of My Heart Will Go On like that. Because it would have made you wish you were on the Titanic going down with it. It was bad. I'm going to have to repent here in a few minutes. 
But at some point, we finish the ceremony, and I pronounce them husband and wife, and they kiss, he kisses the bride, and, and they proceed down the pier, and, and I expect this guy, well, now we're going into the wedding reception time, so is he going to play the chicken dance or the electric slide? And, you know, nothing happens then. And then just like that, we look up, and wedding singer's gone, as if he just wiped his hands and said, my work here is done. I'm going to go on to what I was doing. Still don't know who that was. But it was a first for me. And that's when it occurred to me when I was thinking about it. What we say is really important. Not just the words that are coming out of our mouth, but how we sound when we say them. And I think the believers in Acts took that seriously. Every day, it says, they continue to meet together in the temple courts. And they broke bread in homes. And they ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And so as a result of that, when they met together every day in these courts and ate together with joy, I think that did something. It affected their emotions and their desires and their passions. And when they regularly promised to remember what God had already done through praising and singing, I think that affected how they were talking with each other. And I, I think that they learned this and they lived that out by saying things that were helpful for building others up according to their needs and not tearing them down so that it would benefit people who were listening. And I also think that having that kind of attitude led them to enjoy the favor of all of the other people, which led to others wanting to join closely with them so that those people who didn't know Jesus would actually turn to Christ themselves and start developing and keeping and increasing in their Christian faith. And when you think about all of those things that were happening, it should be no surprise that the Bible says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. When you think about all of these hap things happening, we shouldn't be shocked that the church is growing and people are getting saved as a result of that. And we should be praying for that to happen here in our church. Oh yeah, pray for the saving part, but pray that God changes what we say and how we say it so that people will get saved and want to be a part of what we're doing. You know, every now and then, our 11-year-old, my wife and I will be having an adult conversation uh, and she will overhear us and run over and say, wait, what? She does this because she heard what was said and wanted to know what we were talking about. And knowing this makes me think about what I'm saying most of the time, how I say it, and how it shows what I believe. Because someone might hear me say it. And I think that when they hear me say things and go, wait, what? I better consider what I'm really saying to them. You know, if people hear you say you're living holy, but you sound like a sailor when you say it, what are you really saying? If people hear you talk about how great God is and then hear you gossip about how terrible people are, what are you really saying to them? If people hear you call your spouse babe or boo or bae or sweet thing or whatever term you want to use to refer to them to their face and all you do is put them down later on when you're not with them, what are you really saying to them? If people hear you praise your kids in public and then overhear you belittle them or scream at them behind closed doors, what are you really saying to them? <clears throat> if people hear you talk about how much you love Jesus but never hear from you about how much Jesus loves them what are you really saying to them <clears throat> what we say makes a difference <clears throat> when we get serious about being devoted to doing what God wants <clears throat> we will be so thankful that he reached down for us. <coughs> I'm so sorry. <coughs> and we'll ask him to change their lives. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. <coughs>
He was doing such a good job, too, wasn't he? <laughs> Hey, okay, I'm going to ask you all something. When he, do you notice how when someone's struggling like that, you find yourself clearing your throat for them? Like, ugh, ugh, please. Okay, that's a little bit of what Mike was talking about. This community should be a place where if you're struggling, we're right there with you. And, um, and so this morning, as we kind of wrap up this time where Pastor Mike was talking to us about what we see and what we say in a community where there is a sense of awe, and shared love. If that happens, we don't have to gimmick people to come to church. The Holy Spirit draws them. And I will tell you this. I, I have this uh, solid belief that grows the older I get, and I'm quite a ways down the road now, folks, that if you're here this morning, it's not by accident. If you're here this morning, it's because the Spirit of God brought you here. It's just like I said to you last week. It's time for some of us to stop using the excuses. This is an appointed moment. The Lord is doing some exciting things. And whatever excuse you've used to stay away from God or stay away from the church, whatever hidden anger you may have, whatever disappointments may be in the background, today would be a good day for you to park all of that. Just get rid of all of that and just make a new promise to God and start a new road with God. So if you're here this morning, I want to invite you to do a couple of things. This God that you read about that Mike talked to you about, he's here to meet you and he wants you to be a part of this family. And so I hope that if you're here and you don't know him, that as we sing, if you want to meet him, you'll come. We'll have some elders up here to pray with you. But the other thing I want you to think about is stop making ex excuses. Everybody's busy. Everybody's been hurt. Everybody has to make decisions. And I hope you'll make a new commitment to plug in and become a part of the family. Let's pray together. Father, we bless you this day because you've given us this chance, and it really is a privilege. Wow, the, the great things that we've heard the wonderful things that we see you doing. There's all kinds of, of good churches across the United States, but I particularly like High Point Church. I enjoy what you're doing here, and we don't take it for granted, Lord. The supernatural atmosphere that seems to have been created by your spirit in this place. And right here, this is a moment. Your spirit is among us. Sins could be forgiven. Lives could be changed. Decisions can be made in this next moment that will change our eternity. So don't let us rush past this. And if you've spoken to our hearts this day, we pray, God, that you'll give us the courage and the wisdom to do business with you before we exit. In this last moment of worship, we pray, help us lift our hearts and be real with you so that you can make a real difference in our lives. We pray it in Christ's name and we ask it for his glory. Amen. As we sing, folks, if you need to come, you come.